Welcome to the Art of Procurement podcast. I'm Philip Eitzen, a 20-year procurement practitioner, former head of procurement, advisor to procurement leaders around the world, and the founder and managing director of Art of Procurement. My team and I work with our global network of subject matter experts to help companies elevate procurement's impact whether that's through building and implementing transformation programs, sustainably reducing external expenses, or leveraging AOP Mastermind, our learning and development platform for companies of all sizes. You're listening to our flagship podcast, where we pull back the curtain and shine a light on the strategies, tactics, and tools that leading procurement teams are using to align their results with the needs of the business. Hi everybody, welcome to today's Art of Procurement podcast and with this being the first episode of the month, I am joined as always by Kelly Barner, the owner and managing director of Buyers Meeting Point and general manager here at Art of Procurement. So Kelly, thank you for joining me. Hi Phil, thanks so much, glad to be back. So here we are at the beginning of August. Um, what uh, I'd love to know some of your observations over the past uh, few weeks, you know, and uh, anything that's caught your mind. And this is this is my own perspective. I feel like we've finally hit sort of a pivot, mm-hmm. right? I think everybody for a really long time was living sort of one day, one week. You know, maybe if you're really thinking big, one month at a time. But I think now it's sort of becoming very real that this whole COVID thing and all of the fallout from it is is sort of going to be part of the foreseeable future. Um, so it's interesting to see how accepting that fact is starting to play out in you know, the consumer marketing that we see in longer term conference planning, maybe business travel, I mean, a big one, you know, what's happening with the schools in the fall, yeah. right? That, yeah. that affects professional teams. People may leave the workforce over it. Um, and I think even like a, a simple example, it's something that occurred to me early on, but I've started watching for it elsewhere. Um, I'm an avid daily newspaper reader. Um, and I consider my reward for being so disciplined, always reading the, the comic strip when right. I get to it. And I think it took something, you know, depending on the strip, right? It took between four and six weeks for pandemic jokes, working from home jokes, you know, homeschooling jokes mm-hmm. to kind of hit the comic strips. And it, it occurred to me, like, okay, you know, we've all just learned something. Most comic strips are about a month out, roughly. Um, and I think we're starting to see some of those systemic shifts hit consumer practices, mm-hmm. hit professional situations, hit family decisions. Um, and, and so that's going to be an interesting benchmark as we naturally start to turn our thought process to, to 21, 2021. Yeah. Most of us with our fingers crossed that it bears some sort of resemblance to anything we've ever known as normalcy. Um, and just to see how that starts to play out more specifically within ter- the terms of procurement and supply chain. Yeah, you know, I, I see that we're in, I feel it's, you think about phases of COVID response, you know, phase one is um, mm. the initial panic, phase two is okay, trying to get uh, feet on the ground. And phase three now is, it just yeah. feels like it's a holding pattern. And um, so there's this realization, I think, that we've got to make structural changes ultimately in our supply chains, in uh, in how we buy. And we're also going to be faced with uh, some significant expense reduction pressure, you know, that goes well beyond the, um, you know, bring me three to seven percent in annual cost savings. It's, yeah. uh, there's going to be a lot more demand. Um, and. I think there's still going to be this challenge of doing more with less. You know, we talk a little bit about the holding pattern. I think there's a holding mm-hmm. pattern when it comes to, um, and it kind of pains me to say it, but when you think about staffing and budgets and, you know, right now everything's yeah. been poured into, you know, how can we make sure that we can retain as many folks as possible? Well, when 2021 planning is happening, that I fear that's going to um, be impactful in a way that just is going to um create even more pressures for procurement folks to, like I say, do more with mm-hmm. less. So that's certainly something that um, that I'm watching for. Um, 
Now, I want to kind of segue into today's conversation. And you and I both just spoke with Kathleen Jordan. Kathleen is a consultant at CostCentric, and she has expertise specifically in the marketing category. Um, as regular listeners to the, the pod know, CostCentric is a leading provider of procurement and finance solutions that really help organizations transform how companies purchase, pay, and get paid. We also work really closely with them at Atta Procurement. They're members of our Experts on Demand ecosystem, and they are sponsors of this once a month Ask the Expert series. And so in the conversation that we just had that we're going to play for you here, Kelly and I discuss with Kathleen the current state of marketing procurement and also some considerations of how to engage with marketing for the first time, uh, particularly if this is a category that your organization has not previously been involved in. But, you know, obviously we're in uh, these expense reduction cost saving pressures where there need may be for us to engage with marketing in a way that isn't necessarily comfortable to marketing stakeholders. So we have a good discussion around that. Um, so let's get started. And my first question to Kathleen, as I often ask um, here is, did you find procurement or did procurement find you? Uh, such a good one. So I actually, I would say that I found procurement, mm -hmm. but I didn't know that it was procurement at the time, or I didn't know what I was getting myself into. Right. Uh, but and I guess I, I answer it that way because I tapped into an opportunity that I had identified. Uh, it was a connection between my alma mater and, and my employer mm -hmm. or my future employer at the time. And, uh, and so just jumped on that and it was an entry level position. And, you know, when I started, I was, I was so green, um, because I, you know, I've been sourcing my, my entire career. And so starting, um, really with, uh, within the sourcing firm that I'm with still today, um, again, it was actually acquired. The legacy piece yeah. was, was acquired by core centric, um, you know, started yeah right out of the gate and, uh, and just kind of, you know, entered the world from procurement right from, right, um, right from the get go. And, uh, yeah, been with it ever since. And, and, uh, I grew to love it. And and how did you get involved in the marketing category specifically? So that that was a bit um, organic. You know, we we had a few large scale engagements that were uh, really marketing focused. And when when you even think about the broad um, marketing category and the convergence with procurement, um, you know, marketing tends to be kind of the last uh, last spend category yeah. that's pursued for. You know, cost savings or budget optimization, and so, um, you know, during my you know early years, we we didn't see a great deal of marketing work, but we started to see, you know, an uptick, and and um, and it just fit well with what I had studied and and my you know previous experience in the space. So uh, so yeah, it was a bit more organic, and and just um, you know we started off with some some more tactical spend categories within mm -hmm. the marketing space, but then it got more strategic, and and that's how we uh, we established. Um, a formal practice around the category and the management of it. And that actually is, it really nicely leads me into a couple of questions that I have around marketing specifically. And I want to start actually for those organizations that perhaps they haven't really um, built a particularly strong relationship with marketing yet. And there is obviously pressure. I think everyone's under pressure right now to bring, uh, and I hesitate to use the word uh, cost savings when I talk about marketing, but uh, you know, to find more efficient ways of making an impact, let's say, um, you know, when you're starting to do and you're starting to go down that road with marketing, are there any particular spend categories that you tend to focus on first, you know, to try and build up some trust or, you know, what does that typically look like when you're engaging with marketing for the first time? Sure. So, yeah, there's, there's, you can definitely make the argument that there's some categories that, that are commodity based, um, and uh, and so yeah, getting some rapport um, going and and looking at the more tactical categories. And what what you have to be careful with is is when you do look at a spend uh, or, or I should say a marketing budget. Um, you know, some categories may be tactical for some marketers, mm -hmm. but they're the the more strategic categories for others. You know, if they're the primary tactic yeah. to get in front of your target audience. Yeah. So you've got to keep that in mind as well. Um, but I'd say, you know, production and fulfillment is, is a really good starting point. There, there are your fair share of complexities when looking at that. Uh, a lot of the project-based type work um, where it's hard to baseline um, what, what you're spending if, uh, you know, the specs are changing. Yeah. But I'd say looking, looking closely at, um, 
you know, the, the production piece, which can be everything from print and promo to, um, you know, photography and, and um, graphic design and, and point of purchase displays that, you know, those, those types of areas I think are a good starting point as well as um, events and, and exhibitions. So, um, you know, trade show services, um, fabricating exhibits, and, uh, and trade show booths and, right. and even the, the execution of, of events um, and, and all of that. So those are, I'd say, are, are two um, good starting points, again, just to get, you know, your foot in the door and, and start to, to build up a relationship with marketing and, uh, you know, demonstrate some results and, and uh, go from there. Just, just as a two examples, right. but, uh, but again, those those two kind of break down right into a lot of a lot of different subcategories. Yeah, and it's and it's more about. Um, well, it, the, the, I hesitate to say this because I think every category has, um, you know, there's a lot of long term relationships that are held between marketers and and the providers in that space. Um, but when you go up that curve of complexity and you start getting into agencies and things you know th those are the the ones to you know sometimes you are you're thrown into a, a category like that and and that's kind of that can be a great way to, to a great place to start but like you say if, if you're able to go a little bit more slowly and build up some trust with some of those categories that um perhaps there's going to be more interest from a stakeholder for you to get involved in then that's definitely a good place to start um Right, and we, we have had um, certain scenarios, uh, Phil, in which, you know, a marketer has come to us with some pain points with with their agency, and that, that has been the starting point. Like mm -hmm. like you said, um, you know, if, if there is uh, a critical objective to, to address that is more strategic, you know, that, that has been, uh, you know, some, sometimes the, the initial conversation starter, uh, whether it's running an agency review yeah. or, or there being a new pipeline product that needs a new agency, so running an agency search rather than a review to establish an altogether new partnership. So really all comes back to, to the objectives that marketing has um, and balancing those with procurements. And, and that's, I think, key to, to getting uh, the relationship off on the right foot. Now, are there, as you think about some of those categories and, um, you know, I, I, there's a lot of nuance between a lot of the categories and subcategories, but are there any kind of standard go-to tactics? This is, again, more for folks who um, are really engaging with marketing for the first time that are more prevalent in marketing categories that you may not see in uh, some of the other categories that somebody may have a little bit more experience or an organization may have had more experience supporting. I'd, I'd say strategic sourcing and running sourcing events is, is still certainly applicable, but um, again, a softer way of, of getting into the marketing category as a whole is is performing some benchmarking exercises. Mm -hmm. So, um, and and looking closely at the overall contract management, uh, because when you think about you know different marketing statements of work that that are put in place with agencies, they they tend to be um, you know, yearly type arrangements. And so looking closely at, you know, renewals that are coming up, that might be a good starting point as well to, to get, um, again, just a, a good handle on, on the cadence of, um, you know, different, different relationships and what's looked at every, um, you know, on, on that annual basis, if, if that's a, the cadence that's in place. Um, and, and so giving an opportunity to do some benchmarking and perhaps some negotiations um, that, that could, you could very well collaborate with with the marketing stakeholder yeah. or stakeholders on um, to, to get get started. So that's um, what we tend to, 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 to see a lot of as well is, is just that benchmarking and negotiation approach to start if, if we are you know, touching the, the agency services category to, to start. Um, but I, I'd say what we also see a lot of within the marketing space too is that supplier bench development, mm -hmm. going back to production fulfillment, you know, creating, um, you know, standing up certain contracts for, for particular um, you know, needs, but recognizing the need to, to conduct bidding, um, you know, ongoing bidding processes, yeah. um, if specs are, are due to change and, and things along those lines. So that, that is a, a really good, good strategy to, to, to execute and, and get, um, get some results from to, uh, to just have that, that overall, um, you know, infrastructure in place. So one of the things you mentioned there was the importance of benchmarking, you know, especially as you're starting to, to kind of find your feet within the marketing category. I think to demonstrate um, one, perhaps opportunity, but two, knowledge of the category itself and that you're coming with a, um, 
you know, with an educated perspective. And I just wonder if there's any, I don't know if it's either best practices or particular sources or, you know, just good places for for procurement folks who, again, haven't necessarily touched the marketing category particularly deeply, for them to go to, to get data, to get insights that they can start to benchmark their current deals against. Sure. So there, yeah, there are a good amount of sources um, out there. I, I'd say a good a good starting point, um, you know, as an advertiser, is to take advantage of uh, what the uh, what the uh, A and A holds, uh, and uh, and this might be um, just as a disclaimer. So I might want to edit this piece out a little sure. bit just to make it a little bit cleaner. But um, the Association of National Advertisers is a great resource. Yeah. Um, and and as an advertiser, you can you can join as a member. There's also you know other uh, other types of memberships that exist for for other parties, uh, but that's a great resource. Different events, um, you know, net, you know, networking opportunities, mm-hmm. but a lot of best practices are shared within that association. Interesting. Um, and uh, and of course, there's you know there's other uh, again other folks that contribute that aren't advertisers to, yeah. to kind of round round out the you know the ideas that are that are shared and and um, you know strategies that are that are in play. I know um, there's been a big focus around transparency. Um, that the A and A has has taken a lead on to kind of drive that conversation. Um, so I'd say having a membership for, with the A and A is 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 a good a, a good, good starting start. point. Yeah. Uh, just given the resources they have, yeah, the resources they have available and the different events that they run and and um, things along those lines. But there are you know your fair share of industry blogs and other um, other resources like Ad Age just to keep a pulse on, mm-hmm. on what's going on in in the in the industry. Um, but yeah, A and A to start. Now, Kathleen, as we increasingly see really everything kind of moving in the digital direction, how specifically is that affecting the marketing category? So, you know, I think of some of the examples that have already come up in the conversation. You know, you've mentioned trade shows, in-person events. Obviously, print is a big category for some companies, depending on who their target market is and and where they are and how best to reach them. Um, But even things like point of purchase or promotional items that traditionally would have been branded and handed out, um, how are our most marketing teams driving that push towards digital? So a couple different ways, and I'm, I'm glad you bring that up, Kelly. Um, there, there is you know a greater push towards digital in in a lot of different ways, um, but there's also budget freezes. Um, you know, yeah. we're, we're seeing a shift from you know traditional print publications to, to more of a digital interface, but in some cases, print is just being cut, um, you know, in, in a lot of ways, you know, whether it's in half or, or just, um, you know, brought down substantially given, you know, just the application of the print materials that, that are going yeah. um, in circulation. But we, what, um, you know, I actually connected with, uh, with a thought leader just the other day and, and um, what, what actually is, is being, what we're seeing an increase in from a print standpoint is, is labels. So if you think about oh, shipping and packaging and, and getting, um, you know, just that, you know, that delivery element now uh, right to your door, uh, labels is, is where, you know, we may see, continue to see an uptick in, in print activity. Um, but you could argue that that marketing doesn't always own, own that piece, but um, that, that is, you know, perhaps the, um, you know, the, the, the traditional print in the form of sales materials is going more towards, you know, the, the budget for, for labels in that regard. Um, but, uh, but as far as some other shifts to digital, I mean, yes, events is, is an obvious one in, in terms of everyone working remotely now and, and replacing mm-hmm. events with, with, uh, you know, just virtual, um, technology, uh, like, like zoom and which aren't as effective, but, you know, are still getting certain messages across, um, but uh, I think, you know, again, folks are, are still waiting to hear what, what 2021 will hold. Right now, a lot of planning would typically be happening for 2021 events. Right. And, and so if the planning can't be done uh, for those events, but they still will happen in 2021, um, you know, attendance might go down. So if, if those events still happen. So that's a, a key consideration as well. But there's, I think, still a lot of, a lot of unknowns as far as, um, you know, just where things will 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 land um, and, and the timing of, of the, the COVID um, impact. And so uh, we haven't yet um, seen a great investment yet, just yet in digital, um, you know, away from the traditional side, but we are, um, you know, seeing 
the, the broadcast TV then go down and, and things along those lines and that going to digital media um, in, in a lot of different um, different channels in the, in the digital space. So that's, I, I'd say, another big trend. Um, in, uh, in, in Q3, um, we're, we're, we're expected to see about 30% uh, drop okay. in media spend um, within the, the, you know, the traditional advertising space. Um, of broadcast TV and and uh, things along those lines. So, um, so that's uh, and and again, that's a moving target, right? Um, sure. But yeah, redirecting those do- dollars to digital and and uh, just the increasing importance of of Martech is is going to continue. Mm-hmm. I would say. My okay. <laughs> now, and it's funny you mentioned budgeting, and I think from from past firsthand experience, I share Phil's reticence to say the word savings anywhere near marketing folks. That doesn't tend to endear procurement uh, to, to marketing category owners. Um, but since you brought it up, um, it, it is a concern that procurement tends to have. Typically, the performance metrics that we're driving towards are either specifically cost savings driven or are something about bringing spend under management. Um, and, and we mm-hmm. certainly understand that there's either a misperception or a misalignment of interest. Um, there when it comes to marketing. What is it helpful for procurement professionals to know about the corresponding performance metrics that drive marketing priorities and interests so that maybe we can try to find a way to line up how their performance is evaluated with the ways that procurement is evaluated? Sure, and that's, yeah, that's a really... uh a big conversation that, that needs to, to happen just to encourage that, that open dialogue between marketing and procurement, because in a lot of cases too, when we are, are talking to marketers, it's you know, focus on budget optimization. And if we do come across a, a cost savings opportunity, it could very well be reinvested, um, you know, back into the budget. And so recognizing that, that first, that it may not be, um, you know, cost savings, but um, in some cases a cost avoidance or, or again, just something that, that gets reinvested um, in, into, you know, a new tactic or, or just, um, you know, maybe an increase in, in media dollars. Um, and so, so that's important to recognize first is, is you know, what do we do with, with the results that we deliver, right? Um, and how, um, how do we report on that? But I, I think for, for marketers, you know, all roads really do lead back to return on marketing investment. And I, I would say that, okay. you know, where, where marketers really look for support from procurement is um, the supplier-based accountability metrics. Mm-hmm. And just to, to give you an example there, if we're, um, you know, perhaps working on a, a point of purchase display rollout, maybe a, a new asset uh, refresh, um, you know, obviously doing some supplier identification or, or working closely with the incumbent to, 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 to ensure that they can meet all the, the new specs. But once uh, that mm-hmm. contract is, once we move into contracting mode, um, you know, focusing on, well, how do we define success uh, within this particular mm-hmm. space? And when we're looking at, you know, again, the, the point of purchase display subcategory um, quality, obviously, is, is critical on time production schedules, uh, value engineering and, and innovation and, um, and uh, you know, the, the list goes on, mm-hmm. but establishing those sure. SLAs and KPIs is, I, I'd see, where, where procurement really comes into, into play in, in helping um, you know, marketers have that accountability on the supplier level. Um, because you know, procurement might not be you know, on the front lines of the, the return on our marketing, marketing investment sure. conversations um, and the decisions made around um, you know, the marketing mix as far as you know, product, price, place and, and, and promotion, mm-hmm. um, which all, you know, feeds into it. So, um, but that's, you know, again, what, what we tend to, to see a lot of is, is just, um, you know, ensuring that that all, you know, eventually does trickle up to, to the, the overall return on marketing investment um, in, in terms of what the suppliers are able to, to, to perform. Now, one of the other things that I think both comes up in terms of the transition to digital and actually is something that you know, when we think about marketing ROI, I mean, you're really talking about top line growth, right? So now you're bringing in the, the sales folks. This is actually something that has come up in a number of these category based conversations that we've had. And that is that sort of the more comprehensive the approach that companies and procurement take to bringing these categories of spend and suppliers under management, 
the more likely we are to sort of start bleeding into other areas of functional ownership. And I can't help but wonder, especially if there's a, a marketing platform investment being made, you know, do those lines start to blur a little bit between, you know, where does marketing decision base or interest end and where does IT need to start getting involved, either because there is an integration or there's a security concern? Um, to what extent is IT either becoming a sort of a, a co-sponsor of a lot of these marketing spend projects or at least a secondary interested team of people within the company? Yeah, there's definitely the, the need for, for IT to, to get involved in, in a great deal of, of marketing initiatives these days uh, for, for a number of reasons. And, and so I think, you know, where procurement can really help facilitate that is, is, is recognizing that, um, of course, and, and making sure that, that, um, that there is clarity around, um, you know, the, the key decision makers. Because uh, we've seen, you know, IT coming in later on and, and not disrupting kind of the work that's, that's been done, um, you know, up, up to um, – up to that point, but we've also seen the need to get IT involved early on if, if we're kind of dealing with a green field. So I can give you one example. Um, you know, if, if you're looking to implement you know, a new um, loyalty software or, or to revamp um, your loyalty program um, entirely, um, you know, the need to get IT involved up front is, is critical to kind of define what those requirements will be kind of for the back end piece. And then marketing, you know, obviously is, is curious about the back end piece from a reporting standpoint and, and all the data that, that can be um, you know, reaped from the, 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 the system, but the, the front end is, uh, and the promotion around the, the new loyalty program is, is where marketing will also have a, a great deal of focus. So it's, it, in a way, that particular example is almost a 50-50 split if you think about it. Um, okay. So I'd say that the, it's, yeah, to, to get IT involved um, you know, up front will obviously depend on on the solution you're looking to implement, but, um, but procurement can, can ask all the right questions, ensure that, that mm -hmm. you know, all the requirements are, are built, uh, built out um, and, and sh you know, eventually shared with the, the suppliers that are, that are bidding and that, uh, again, that all the right parties are involved um, you know, throughout the process and the key milestones uh, to, to, make, uh, to make the right call as to who to partner with. Um, and again, that's just um, you know, in the event of, of software, um, but what oh, yeah. also is happening is, you know, some, some marketers are, are looking closely at things and, and deciding what to move in-house um, as far as what they want to control, um, you know, as opposed to, to outsourcing and, uh, you know, to, to perhaps just have a, a, um, a greater pulse on, on marketing effectiveness. And so depending on what's being brought in-house, there may be the need to, to get IT even more involved to stand up, um, you know, a particular solution. If it's if it's going to to need to to tie back to to a lot of data points. Now you mentioned things coming in house. I'm really intrigued and kind of interested. What kind of categories or subcategories are you seeing where that's part of the you know that make or buy is part of the decision making process? So a lot of different ones. I mean, when it when it comes when you yeah think about the the marketing category broadly, you know, obviously it breaks down in, into a number of subcategories. I would say there there's you know certainly your fair share of in-house um, media agencies that are mm -hmm. um, that, that tie to to the probably the largest uh, I guess the, the largest companies from a a, mar um, a media you know buy standpoint. Um, but what we've also seen is you know graphic design and more of those production and fulfillment yeah. categories coming in house and in terms of managing that, but also having a team that that creates you know the the collateral at the end of the day. Um, so I'd say that that's um, you know could, could be pretty common again for for the larger um, you know advertisers out there. Um, but uh, as far as you know where where there's more focus now is is on the media side, okay. bringing in um, you know that piece, the buying and 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 the planning. And, uh, and still, you know, collaborating with, with agencies, but being mindful of, you know, just going back to the agency transparency piece, that being such a hot topic for, for a number of years now. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and some, some advertisers are, again, are, are, um, you know, getting to the point where they, you know, decided to, to bring that in and own it on their own. Um, and so that, that leads to, you know, establishing some tools that, uh, will help manage, manage that category given, uh, right. given just the, how, how it really data-driven these days. Yeah, it's interesting as kind of the, the 
the internal definition of what is a core competency changes, you know, and, and how the trend goes from, well, let's outsource everything and we're just going to manage the providers. And it's, you know, it, it's a little more in some cases than a supplier management activity to, you know what, maybe we went a little bit too far and we're going to start bringing some of these things back in house. Um, and, and it's more, when you go back to the measure of that, it's not about uh, efficiency of process efficiency. It's more around outcomes and that total return on marketing investment you talked about earlier and is that better served internally than going out external to a supplier it is a big decision to make that that move to, to bringing something you know in-house and, and really vice versa right um if, if you've been handling something internally for for a number of years and, and making that that move to, to an outsource model you know it's it's a big decision regardless of you know again insourcing versus outsourcing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think where procurement can really enable, um, you know, the decision there, the right decision is, is doing that overall rationalization and optimization and having, um, helping to facilitate those conversations and, and, um, you know, again, just helping mark, um, you know, marketers with, um, whatever decision they, they, you know, deem best. Um, you know, because I think if, if it, if it still is being brought, um, you know, in house, I think, uh, again, procurement can, can help with, you know, the analysis behind right. it all and, yep. and, uh, and the vetting. Absolutely. No, um, no, one of the things that you, a couple of things actually, uh, that you talked about was, um, budgets being, um, cut or being frozen right now, you know, because of all the uncertainty that we're in the world that we're living in right now. And that trend from, um, what are more traditional advertising channels to digital uh, and as a confluence of those two things are you finding that procurement support of the marketing category is is more in demand or is it still a you know that it's um that marketing folks are coming to procurement and asking for help or it's still more of a a push you know that we're still trying to push the value proposition of procurement towards marketing in the hope that they'll uh, they'll see the value proposition and want to engage with us I I'd say it's it's still a bit of a a push mm -hmm. um, to to get um, you know marketing engaged and and really it's just primarily because uh, we're I'd say we're still in reactive mode yeah. um, you know marketing is is still determining you know how to get in front of their target audience and in, you know where where they are right and how to reach them and so. Um, again, I think there's still some hesitancy to, to invest in, in altogether new new channels be, because, um, like I mentioned earlier, it's it's hard to really determine yet how how long that impact COVID will have on on uh, consumer behavior. And so um, we haven't yet really seen um, that that you know that pulling of, of procurement in, into conversations just yet because um, I think uh, there's still a lot of budget discussions happening. Right. Um, around where where the dollars belong and for how long, um, and uh, and so so again, but you know, getting you know making them aware that that we're here to help, um, you know, in the event that there need to be um, some perhaps contract negotiations or contract renewals, and making sure the right language exists in them, and and just um, helping with uh, the the conversations that may need to to be had as far as the need for greater flexibility with with the supply you know, the supply base that supports, you know, the marketing mm -hmm. function today. Um, I, I think, you know, just with media budgets being scaled back in, in some cases, um, you know, that obviously has an impact on, on um, agencies as well in terms of them, you know, having a management component of, of all of that. And, and again, I think flexibility is, is critical, um, you know, when, when it comes to really any marketing category or, or really any, any category um, at this point in terms of just that right dialogue with the suppliers that, that support the day-to-day. -day. Yeah, I'm sure that you are um, seeing at the moment a lot of, you know, as you say, they're try, still trying to figure out and be reactive to what works. So a, a lot of experimentation um, and probably small investments um, that may not even cross typical you know, thresholds when you think about, well, what's the dollar amount when you should really start looking to engage with the procurement? Um, and so it's small, lots of small experiments to see what works before the marketing team figures out what scales. Um, and when they figure out what's going to scale, then they've probably already got those relationships because they've done an experiment. So it's, it's kind of a hard spot for procurement to be in. Um, and I just wonder if there's any, one, I'd, I'd love to know if that's actually playing out with what you're seeing and to if it is you know are there things that we can do as procurement professionals to just to make sure that we don't we're not late to the uh 
it's the wrong terminology, but you know, late to the party, so to say, that um, it's already these deals have already been decided by the time they're ready to scale. Sure. Well, I, I, I mean, I think what's what's critical for for procurement to know is you know you know how often those budget discussions are happening and, mm-hmm. and to, to to get involved. Um, you know, right now could very well be budgeting season for um, next year. Um, you know, regardless of COVID. Yeah. Um, but I'm sure that there's you know ongoing dialogue around you know just just how uh, the marketing budget is is being reworked and and um, for procurement to 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 stay as, as involved in those discussions as they possibly can um, to just understand you know if there is a significant shift to an altogether maybe new category um, because a new channel needs to be established um, or a new tactic then I I think that that triggers the need for for greater involvement as well beyond just you know, being involved in those mm-hmm. budget discussions. Um, and I think you know, going back to to what I had shared earlier on about you know benchmarking and negotiations, I think that um, you know if if there is a shift in um, you know the budget in in a more positive way um, because dollars are are perhaps being invested um, you know in different in a different um, you know category than where they you know initially fell, then that could you know trigger the need for for a negotiation yeah. um, you know with with an incumbent so I think keeping that in mind as well if there's a contract renewal or um, you know just maybe the establishment of an establishment of an altogether new contract if, if the scope of work is is expected to change to um, due to that budget budget shift so just keeping that that in mind um, as well so it actually sounds like you know, not that it's necessarily under pleasant or, or chosen circumstances, but it sounds like this is a huge opportunity for maybe some procurement teams or leaders that haven't had as much of an opportunity to start making an impact in the marketing category to start approaching it. Um, and whether it's the first time that we're approaching one of these teams or, or maybe a situation where we had a rocky start and backed off and we're going to try to come back in. Um, given both the nature of the spend and to totally overgeneralize, you know, sort of the, the type of professional that tends to be within marketing. Um, are there any, you know, terminology, language recommendations, right? I mean, obviously it's not going to do much to build a relationship bridge if, you know, procurement comes crashing in and says, you know, hey, we heard you guys are short on cash. I'm right? like, that's, that's not going to win marketing over to sort of a value oriented perspective to working on procurement. Um, and I know you've mentioned things around supplier performance, cost avoidance. Those are certainly regular phrases that we're using in procurement anyway. Um, but is there any recommendation you would make around tone when we approach marketing, either words and phrases that we should stay away from or words or phrases that we should try to emphasize regardless of what that actually ends up meaning about the actual strategies that we use or, or approaches that we take. Sure. And that's, yeah, that's a, a critical um, thing to, to, you know, to figure out. And, and I think, you know, when it comes to first impressions, uh, you know, procurement, yeah, does have to, to really nail it uh, to get marketing, um, you know, buy-in right off the bat. And so, Really, those initial discussion points with with marketing should be centered around you know, driving that that collaboration and and striking the right balance between marketing's objectives and procurement's objectives and, and recognizing both sets of, of of objectives, but then again collaborating to increase ROI while also gaining results for 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 the overall um, the organization. And and I think yeah, cost savings is is definitely. Um, something to, to avoid as much as possible and, and really just talk about maximizing investments um, and, and how to do that. So um, again, supplier engagements and, um, and management and, and, and making sure that the suppliers that are engaged are aligned with, with uh, the marketing vision and understand it and understand the brand. Um, but then delivering value is also, um, you know, critical as well and making sure that, um, you know, the agencies that are supporting or the, the, the entire supply base that's supporting the marketing function, um, you know, is delivering value at the end of the day and, and make sure that, that that can be defined as much as possible because uh, there is there um, is you know, some level of ambiguity um, there, of course. Yeah. But I think, again, your first impression with, with marketing needs to, to kind of be focused on collaboration, 
maximizing investments and, and delivering that value. And I think even before having that conversation with, with marketing, it's, it's certainly helpful to do your homework um, as far as understanding the company's marketing, you know, how, how marketing ticks in the sense of what's the mm-hmm. company's target market and how are they typically reached. Again, that, that could very well be shifting today given what's, sure. what's going on. Um, but learning, you know, just the customer journey and, and how the, the end consumer purchases your company's product or service, um, I think having that in hand will, will even help procurement understand why they're seeing spend in certain areas as well. Mm-hmm. Um, because, again, you might think that print is a tactical spend category, but it could be um, there could be a significant direct mail campaign going on and that okay. there will be your primary tactic and so your direct mail vendor should it be called a vendor they should be called a strategic partner so those are mm. again things that procurement needs to think about before starting to talk to um, marketing just to have that that prep work done and and know uh, where the conversation should start as well or, or, or very well where it could go um, in terms of focus um, and uh, yeah, well, and, and that, any data can be collected too in advance of yeah. discussion. You know, that certainly helps as well. Um, you know, in the form of contracts and, and budget details and and brand portfolio and and um, and even industry research. So, like we talked about earlier, um, mm-hmm. you know, having an A and A membership and and just um, you know reading up on Ad Age and, and Ad Week and and um, even doing some competitor research could go a long way. And one thing that you had mentioned that I actually feel like is something that we might, we meaning procurement, um, could easily sort of gloss past, but I actually think is really critical, is you talked about collaboration. Um, And I think in most of our efforts, procurement is really trying hard to take a collaborative approach. And yet, I would still think that for many of us, it would be sort of an automatic instinct to say, okay, we're going to approach marketing, and the first thing that we're going to do is figure out what we're going to source. When in fact, it might actually be not only more effective from a results perspective, but also more effective from a relationship building standpoint to interpret collaboration a little bit more broadly and just sit down and kind of have a business alignment conversation around, okay, where are you? What are your concerns? What's new? Which suppliers are performing? Which are not? And in fact, when we think of the whole breadth of the procurement scope, if sourcing might not be the entry point at all. It might be, you know, helping them understand a little better where they are on their spend to date for the year or helping them address a performance problem um, or helping them, you know, kind of put some flexibility into their plans for next year. We have a lot of things that we know how to do, but not assuming that sourcing is going to be the starting point would probably lead to a better initial conversation with marketing. Is that accurate? Yes, you nailed it, Kelly. I mean, you've got to position that initial meeting as, as a discovery session um, where you want marketing to do more of the, the talking around what their plans are because even if you look at historical spend, that's only going to get you so far um, just because you know the next year could be entirely different from the previous one. Mm-hmm. Um, if there's a significant, you know, a new investment or, um, you know, an altogether rebrand, you name it, there, there could be a lot of, of things that, that end up being a priority um, that, that you didn't see spend activity around in the previous year. And so I think, like you said, um, coming in with, with the goal of understanding marketing's objectives while, while also demonstrating per, that procurement understands um, you know, how marketing ticks to a certain extent and, and how mm-hmm. um, you know, the, the spend could go in a, in a certain direction. I think that's, that, that's yeah, a, a great... The, the, the proper way to start the conversation. Well, Kathleen, I just have one um, final question before we uh, wrap up, and it's kind of a here and now, um, a COVID-related question. It goes back to uh, the conversation we had uh, earlier, again, about that transition to more digital um, categories as uh, as marketers are looking and trying to find other ways to connect with their uh, essentially their target audience, um, especially with the all the in-person channels not really being available to them. Now, do you uh, or when when you see organizations planning for the future, do you see there's an expectation that 
you know, when uh, we have a day that uh, coronavirus isn't around us everywhere and everyone can go back to whatever the normal is, that normality re resumes in terms of spend and spend allocation? Or do you think this move to digital, especially because it's one that is, you know, it, it's 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 not something that folks are just doing for a couple of weeks. It's something that it's going to be prevalent for 6, 12, 18 months. Is that going to reshape the, what long-term looks like in terms of the channels and the tactics that marketers use? And therefore, those that shift in dollars is going to be more structural, you know, for the long term. Yeah, I do. I do think that some of the changes that that are being made now, or, or some of the budget shifts, could could very well be permanent, mm -hmm. um, in in to, to a certain extent, in terms of uh, just the the introduction of, of of new technology to leverage. Um, I think some consumer behavior will 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 likely stay stay the same too for for the long term, um, just due to um, you know I think this. Where we are right now and, and the environment, I think, will have a long-term impact, not only on um, consumer behavior, but, but also, um, again, just that, uh, you know, there may be, digi you know, learnings from, from a digital investment that could make marketers' lives easier, too, yeah. or even, you know, enable better decision-making from a data, data uh, standpoint. So I think there could very well be um, some permanency around some of the changes that are being made um, right now that are, are more reactive, but they they could be um, here to stay. But it is it is hard to hard to say, um, you know that of course. But um, I think like like you said as well, there has been a gradual shift to mm -hmm. digital over the years, um, and and you know a cutback on on traditional print, um, just because of um, you know the, the the different you know generations and and where where to find them, and so. Um, I think, again, it, it'll continue to, to be a, a gradual investment, even if things do go back right. to pre-COVID levels. Um, so, but we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> Time will tell, as that, it always does. That's always one of the interesting yeah. things right now is, um, you know, just kind of watching for the signals and, um, and being mm -hmm. prepared for the unknown. Um, and, you know, having plans in place that, that enables you to be as flexible as you possibly can to change as the world around us changes. Um, so, Kathleen, I want to thank you so much for joining Kelly and I today on the podcast for your insights around the marketing category. Um, the very last question, and I say every time this is the easy question, is that if listeners would like to um, kind of follow up directly with you, um, uh, connect with you directly, what would be the best place or where would be the best place for them to find you? Sure. Well, again, I, I appreciate the opportunity to, to speak with you both today. And, and yes, if there's any um, any interest in reaching out to me directly after uh, listening to, to our conversation, um, I, you can find me on on LinkedIn, um, with Kathleen Jordan, and uh, or visit um, you know our website, um, which is CoreCentric, yeah. um, CoreCentric.com, and uh, and and yeah, I hope uh, yeah, this this conversation triggers more conversation. Um, in a lot of different ways. All right. Well, great. Well, what we're going to do is, uh, and we always do this, we're going to put the links that you mentioned there to your LinkedIn profile to CoreCentric um, on the show notes for today's episode. Those are going to be at artofprocurement.com slash episode 332. That's episode 332. You go there, you'll find the links to Kathleen and to CoreCentric. So Kathleen, um, thank you very much for joining us. And Kelly, thank you very much for your support as well.